Good morning and afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Gorell, and thank you for participating in today's 141st Justice Clearinghouse webinar entitled Developing a Prosecution Strategy Utilizing Crime Gun Intelligence. This webinar is sponsored by Altera Electronics Forensic Technology, who is dedicated to educating justice personnel around the world about developing effective crime gun intelligence programs. They are a leader in forensic analysis, providing innovative and effective solutions like its unique technology, the Integrated Ballistics Identification System. IBIS is designed to find the needle in the haystack by discovering matches between pairs of spent bullets and cartridge cases at speeds well beyond human capacity. Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology helps experts obtain timely information so they can make society a safer place. Now to create the best possible conditions for a successful prosecution in a case involving crime guns and ballistic evidence, it is imperative that there is a strong partnership between the investigators, forensic experts, and prosecutors. In this final installment of Ultra Electronic Forensic Technology's six-part crime gun intelligence webinar series in 2017, prosecutors from two different jurisdictions will, will describe how they utilize specific intelligence to build prosecutions, give examples of cases, and discuss how they have set out to change the mindset of prosecuting the quote-unquote regular old shootings. Our moderator for today is Ron Nichols, who has 25 plus years of experience as a firearms and toolmark examiner at the local and federal levels in accredited laboratories. He is widely published with a number of his publications, routinely referenced in published court decisions with respect to Daubert and Fry evidentiary hearings. He has testified in over 100 criminal cases and evidentiary hearings involving firearms and toolmark evidence at the state and federal levels. Following him, our first presenter is Will Morris, who is a 2003 graduate of Louisiana State University Law School. After a clerkship with a state criminal court judge, Will joined the East Baton Rouge Parish District Attorney's Office in 2005. And as of September 2015, he is Section Chief of the East Baton Rouge Paris District Attorney, Attorney's Crime Strategies Unit. Will supervises the unit, which consists of two assistant district attorneys, including himself, an assistant U.S. attorney, three investigators, two National Guard counter-drug intelligence analysts, and eight interns from the Sociology Department at Louisiana State University. The District Attorney's Crime Strategies Unit is a multi-agency unit whose mission is to improve public safety through data and intelligence-driven prosecutions and crime intervention efforts. And then our final presenter is Brian Gray, who has been an Assistant District Attorney for the, I should have asked him how to pronounce this, County District Attorney's Office in New York since 2010. In 2012, he joined the Spe Special Victims Unit where he prosecuted crimes perpetuated against children and crimes of sexual assault. In 2015, he moved to the Major Crimes Bureau where he prosecutes homicides, attempted murders, and other crimes involving illegal firearms. He has received guilty verdicts in numerous felony level trials including murder, attempted murder, robbery, burglary, and rape. Then the last thing I'd like to address with everyone is some basic housekeeping items for our webinar today. First, the event is being recorded and is scheduled to last between 45 and 60 minutes. Second, this is a listen-only event, but you can type any questions you have through the GoToWebinar toolbar and we'll address as many at the conclusion of the presentation. And finally, after today's webinar, there will be a follow-up survey and we ask that you complete it. Your feedback does help us shape our future schedule of events. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn our presentation over to our moderator. Ron, it's all yours. Thank you, Aaron. And if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. This is the final presentation of our six-week webinar series, six-part webinar series, discussing the six tenets required to develop and successfully attain regional crime gun protocols. The series began with an overview of one of the biggest challenges faced, how to find funding and then was followed by the individual steps required to achieve a regional crime gun program, which include making crime gun a priority in your region, establishing a crime gun intelligence program for your region, crime gun investigative cycle bridging the gaps, and then forensics at the speed of crime. All of these webinars are available through Justice Clearinghouse, 
in each webinar focused on finding ways to sustain improvement within the subject matter area through a balance of people, processes, and technology. Next. Now, before going into the uh, uh, the webinar itself, where we have, should be highlighting some terms. IBIS is the Integrated Ballistic Identification System and is a technology. And it's a standard in over 70 different countries uh, worldwide. NIBIN is the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network and is a program that is administered by ATF. A NIBIN lead. A NIBIN lead is the IBIS output results, and it is not evidence. Actually, it is an investigative lead only, and it is a potential hit that the investigators can use to investigate their their uh, various shootings that they have assigned to them. And a hit is an expert confirmation of a potential candidate linking at least two criminal cases or shooting events. This is actually evidence. This is when this is what can be taken to court and presented before a jury. And Ivan Lee does not have that same standard, but a hit does have that standard uh, for court readiness. Next. Crimes on tracing is a review of the firearms transaction record to learn the transfer history associated with a particular firearm from manufacturer to first retail sale. And E-Trace is the electronic trace system for U.S. source guns provided by ATF. Next. Now, when murders go unsolved, victims are denied liberty and justice. Their families are robbed of resolution and closure, and their neighborhoods are forsaken uh, peace and stability. Repeated and retaliatory acts of gun violence soon occur, and the entire community soon become victims themselves. Businesses close, jobs disappear, and property values plummet. When it comes to catching criminal shooters, the process is basically the same the world over. Police must respond and collect evidence. Then they use forensic processes to develop more clues to extract and analyze, and then identify, apprehend, and charge the suspect, which is pursue and apprehend. It takes sound policies that leaders put in place to drive these processes and operations, and then it takes proper adherence to sustain them. A regional approach is often essential to a successful investigation as criminals in the course of their illicit activities often crisscross multiple jurisdictions. Timeliness is critical to these processes. The longer armed criminals remain free, the more opportunities they have to do more harm. The International Association of Chiefs of Police has adopted a resolution stating that it views regionally applied crime gun and evidence processing protocols as a best practice for the investigation of firearm-related crimes and encourages law enforcement officials, prosecuting attorneys, and forensic experts to collaborate on the design of mutually agreeable protocols best suited for the region. All of this requires a proper balance of people, processes, and technology. Today, we are going to present you part six of the six steps to solving more gun crime. Will and Brian are going to discuss charging strategies used in crime gun intelligence, and you will learn how they leverage multi-agency collaboration and establish policies to form successful prosecutions. Thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you all for inviting me to participate in this today. It's, a, it's an honor to, to be a part of this. Um, as Ron mentioned, uh, I'm the section chief of our Crime Strategies Unit here in East Baton Rouge Parish in Louisiana, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, we started up the unit in the fall of 2015. Um, all, my boss, the district attorney here in Baton Rouge, decided that uh, he wanted to be a little bit more proactive in our crime intervention efforts. Uh, rather than just assuming the naturally reactive role of being a prosecutor because the, the traditional role of a prosecutor, you naturally have to have a lot of bad things happen first before uh, a file comes to your desk. So uh, part of what our mission was was to uh, try to get a better idea of 
who was driving crime in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, particularly firearms crime, and uh, bridge some gaps uh, between our local and federal law enforcement partners and see how we could improve our processes. Our personnel consists of two assistant DAs, including myself. Uh, we have an assistant U.S. attorney that works with us in a part-time capacity. Uh, naturally, we work closely with them on firearms cases. Uh, we want to have a good, strong relationship with them so that we can, uh, if we have priority offenders, that we can get them in the court where we can get the most bang for our buck. So we work very closely with our local U.S. Attorney's Office and, uh, and try to divert uh, federal cases to, uh, to them when it, when it makes sense. Uh, we have a partnership with the National Guard. We have uh, two National Guard counter drug intelligence analysts that uh, work with us full time. Um, they, they are the, the, the people that crunch the data for us and can tell us where our hot spots are and uh, use the data to, to assist us in identifying our, our priority offenders. Uh, we have three district attorney's office investigators that uh, are full time with the unit. And we also have a, a strong relationship with the sociology department at LSU. Uh, we've developed an internship program with them where students get course credit uh, to come out and uh, work 100 hours with us for the semester. Uh, mostly what we have them doing is listening to jail calls. Obviously, that's a valuable source of intelligence, and, um, and particularly in gun cases, and we've had a lot of success with capturing some, some really good jail calls. Uh, in the picture you see, that's our district attorney that's third from the left, Mr. Hiller Moore. That's me on the right. Uh, you've got Ed Shahada, who's the chair of our sociology department here at LSU, uh, as well as some of our investigators, assistant DA, our National Guard analysts, and some of our LSU interns. You can go to the next slide. Uh, as Ron mentioned, our, um, the District Attorney's Crime Strategy Unit mission is, is that we're a multi-agency unit whose mission is to improve public safety through data and intelligence-driven prosecutions and crime intervention efforts. Next slide. So once we got started, um, we realized that um, we had some gaps here in Baton Rouge that, that we thought that our unit could work with the lab and with law enforcement agencies to, to help fill some of those gaps, uh, particularly related to NIBIN. Uh, we have a very good Crossland State Police Crime Lab here that's uh, in Baton Rouge, and um, they, they do a great job for us and they are constantly pushing out uh, NIBIN leads and NIBIN hits. The, uh, the gaps that we found is that many of the more serious cases uh, were, were getting noticed. Uh, the homicide cases, the attempted murder cases, the high harm cases, uh, that information was getting communicated back to law enforcement, and communicated to prosecutors, and those leads were being followed up on. What we realized, though, is that there was a lot of NIBIN leads coming out of the lab that were, were high value and involved uh, priority targets, but they weren't necessarily getting the attention they deserved. So um, at the request of Baton Rouge City Police, we decided that we would take on the responsibility of analyzing every NIBIN lead that came out of the lab. So the process that we set up with the lab is that they'll notify us whenever there is a potential hit. Uh, we'll assign it to one of our investigators who, do, who will do a preliminary screening and work up on the, on the lead, and then we'll push that information back to law enforcement if we think that it could further an investigation, and we'll push those uh, leads and confirmations down to our assistant DAs who have cases that are affected. Um, one, one change that we implemented was that prior to us getting involved, our lab was trying to confirm every single NIBIN lead that they generated. Uh, that, that resulted in a big backlog because, as we all know, uh, different NIBIN leads have different value. And many of the low value cases uh, aren't necessarily worthy of a, of a confirmation. If you've got two scenes hitting to each other with an unrecovered firearm, no suspects, uh, that, that lead may become relevant later on when a firearm is recovered, but our lab was trying to spend it, spending an inordinate amount of time trying to confirm uh, leads that were low harm and low value. So we've, we've worked with our lab on, on streamlining that process. So now, now they're able to 
shorten their turnaround time because they're not trying to trying to confirm every lead. Uh, the screen you see here is a screenshot of our our page. Our our we, we have a SharePoint page where we warehouse all of our um, NIBIN analysis. And um, and and you see on the right there's a CSU action. We'll we'll take the take the hit document when we the lead document when we received it. Who, which investigator it got assigned to? Uh, when we completed our analysis, we'll uh, load our completed analysis uh, into the page and uh, document what our CSU action was. Uh, whether that was communicating the information to prosecutors, back to law enforcement, um, and also whether or not we were requesting confirmation at that time. Go to the next slide. This is an example of uh, one of the link diagrams that we have our National Guard analysts prepare in connection with some of the uh, leads and hits that we get. Uh, what we quickly found out is that many of these uh, leads, when you have multiple cases hitting to each other with multiple firearms involved, it can get very difficult to wrap your head around. So um, these link diagrams that are prepared by our analysts in-house um, are, are, are val very valuable in trying to wrap your head around some of these cases and also for uh, presenting them in court. Go to the next slide. This is a, a diff a, a, another link diagram. This one's prepared by our uh, ATF office down in New Orleans. We have a very close wor working relationship with them. Um, when, whenever we do any of our uh, analyses, we'll push it down to their office down in New Orleans so that they can document it. And they also help us out by putting together these lead charts. Um, as you can see by this one, this is one of, the, one of the biggest ones that we have right now that is currently active. Uh, there's two families involved that are feuding with each other, a lot of back and forth shooting. And as you can see, a lot of firearms, some recovered, some not. All of the all of the red dots is a uh, recovered firearm. All of the gray dots are firearms, represent firearms that are involved but have not yet been recovered. So um, as you can see, this is a spider web of, uh, of information that can be impossible to wrap your head around or, or to present in court without um, without some visual to, to show the connections. You go to the next slide. Also, uh, this is prepared by our National Guard analysts. We, uh, we prepare this daily and uh, push it out to law enforcement. Um, we do a, this is a daily shots fired report. So we'll t they'll take the data every morning from the uh, previous 24 hours and we'll push this product out to law enforcement so that uh, they can know which areas of town are worthy of uh, some proactive enforcement efforts and uh, also help us identify uh, who in those areas is responsible for um, the, the, the shooting. Um, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure here, just like in other places, it's a small group of people in some of these neighborhoods that are causing the majority of the problems and we want to uh, be able to timely intervene in those problem neighborhoods so that we can uh, identify who's causing the problems um, and then work towards getting them apprehended and then work with our prosecutors downtown on building quality cases against them. And um, the timeliness of the information is crucial so that we can uh, communicate information to the courts for, for purposes of bond. Um, these are a couple close-ups from the previous slide that uh, just highlight uh, two specific areas that, for that particular day, had a uh, had a lar larger number the larger number of shots fired. You can go to the next slide. Um, in addition to the daily shots fired report, we'll have our analysts also do a uh, monthly analysis, and um, the completed version is 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 a number of pages. And I didn't include all of the all of the pages for our this monthly analysis, but included some pages that I thought would be would be of interest. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So as you can see, we do uh, monthly and daily trends, frequency breakdown, district zone breakdown, 
Um, all homicides in locations that occurred during that month are top active streets and addresses. And then we'll highlight a few particular hot spots that uh, we want to document and pass along to law enforcement to, uh, so that they can help us identify who the trigger pullers in those area, areas are. So you've got kind of the 10,000 foot view of seeing the whole parish, but then you've got kind of the micro hotspot analysis of the, of the particular areas. You can go to the next slide. So this is an example of one of our hotspots, an area of town called Dixie, which encompasses a number of, of police zones. It's one of our more um, active shots fired areas. Um, and as you can see, we break down all of the shots for the month and where the, where the most frequent uh, locations for those shots are. Uh, also, how the shots are trending from the, from the previous months. Go to the next slide. This is another one of our one of our hot spots um, in a zone that encompasses an area called uh, Brookstown, which is one of our one of our high crime areas. Um, we had last year two families that were feuding over there that uh, that, that caused a, 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 that were responsible for a large number of shots fired. A lot of those individuals have been taken into custody, um, but it still remains one of our one of our hottest spots. Um, and as you can see, for October of this year, we had a significant increase in jump from August and September in shots fired incidences in that area. And again, we've uh, highlighted some particular locations that seem to have an inordinate amount of activity. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, another uh, example of one of our hotspots, an area called the Park. Uh, we have a gang that operates in that area that is responsible for the large majority of the problems in that area. So uh, we're constantly tracking shots fired in that area and um, have identified all of the active members of the, of the gang and uh, work closely with law enforcement in uh, developing investigations and, and prosecutions of those individuals. Um, you can also see some pictures there of some of the most frequent locations for, for problems in, in, in that area known as the park. You can go to the next slide. This is another one of our, our hottest areas, um, an area of town called the Bottoms, which uh, is just on the north side of, of LSU, Louisiana State University. So um, that that's obviously causes us some concern. We have uh, two um, gangs that operate in that area, um, two, two main ones. We actually have closer to four that operate in that area, but two, two of the larger ones in Baton Rouge operate in this area. And um, there's an inordinate amount of shots fired in that area. Um, we've also noticed that um, with, with two particular offenders, uh, the numbers tend to decrease whenever they are arrested and put in jail. We had a situation last year where there was a, a lot of shots fired in their particular area. A proactive enforcement effort took them off the streets, and all of a sudden, for the next month, the, the shots fired in that area dropped dramatically. So um, we're able to track what's going on and how how uh, proactive enforcement efforts can can affect the uh, shots fired in, in these particular areas. You can go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Yep, it's on the next slide. I think there's just a little bit of a delay. If you want to go ahead and okay. uh, move on with the success stories. Okay. Um, yeah, a few, a few success stories uh, from from um, some of our NIBIN efforts. Uh, this is a uh, link diagram on a defendant by the name of Christopher Thornton, who is uh, a murder defendant on a case that I'm handling, and. Um, the, the NIBIN information for this prosecution is, is absolutely crucial. The uh, first incident in his crime spree is the, the one on the left, and it involved an attempted murder where he uh, shot up a vehicle and um, actually struck two of the individuals in the vehicle. 
Um, the firearm evidence recovered at that scene became crucial. That that was my strongest. That's my strongest count from a from a witness perspective because I have an independent witness who who IDs him as the shooter. She knew him from school, and uh, the the victims had no no idea who he was and couldn't pick him out of the lineup. But having an independent witness that was able to to identify him. Um, about five hours after the attempted murder, where he shot up the car, there was a homicide on a sep in a separate area of town, which uh, at first went cold because there was uh, they didn't have any leads or or any information as to who had done the killing. But it turned out that the same firearm that was used in the first shooting of the two victims in the car, uh, Nibin hit to the, the murder of Christian Allen, which happened five hours later. Um, the the Niven information is what ties Christopher Thornton to that scene. I don't have any, I don't have any witnesses, um, but the fact that the same gun was used and I've been able to establish a motive for uh, why he would want to kill Christian Allen, I have a, I have a viable count on that, uh, on that homicide. It turned out that Christian Allen was a, a marijuana dealer and uh, and was a dealer for this for this particular gang that Thornton was in, and he had discussed with some of his uh, his fellow group members about about how he wanted to uh, to rip off Christian Allen, and uh, so that that I've been able to establish the motive, which is to rob Christian Allen of his money and drugs. The uh, third shooting in this series of hits on the far right involves another attempted murder, where uh, about a month later. Thornton went to his friend Jeremiah Hall's house and shot him. Jeremiah Hall um, picked Thornton out of a lineup. He's going to be a problematic witness at trial because he's a fellow fellow gang member. But what Hall, do Hall does is establish the motive for the Christian Allen murder. It also turns out that the firearms that were used in the um, Hall-Thornton shooting also had valuable Niven links back to a shooting on a, an unrelated shooting at a house on Fry Street, where uh, Christopher Thornton's ID was found, and also the burnt clothes of the deceased victim Christian Allen from the homicide count were found at that scene. So I have Niven information linking Hall and Thornton to that scene where the um, the victim's burned clothes were found and Christopher Thornton's ID was found. So. As you can see, um, each each of these three counts, these three incidences, um, while on their own, I wouldn't, I likely wouldn't be able to carry the day, except for the first one where I have an independent witness. But once you uh, drop the Niven correlations into into each of these events and each of these scenes, um, all of a sudden I've got a, a viable viable case on a on a very violent person that needs to spend the rest of his life in jail. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is an example of multi-agency collaboration and leveraging other intel sources to bolster hits, uh, specifically jail calls and social media. As I mentioned, we have our interns from LSU. Mostly what we have them doing is listening to jail calls. Uh, we also do a lot of work with, uh, with social media. Uh, this, this hit involves a homicide that happened in Baton Rouge and there was a subsequent firearm recovery in Harvey, Louisiana, which is in Jefferson Parish, which is uh, right outside of New Orleans. And um, the, the significance here is that the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office was able to intercept jail calls from um, Lakia, Lakia Nero when they were arrested on a illegal possession of stolen of firearm case in, in Jefferson Parish. And in the calls, she talks about, um, wait till they find out what that gun is attached to. I told Lionel not to bring that gun down here, talking about Lionel Harris. So basically giving it up that she knew that that gun was used in the homicide in Baton Rouge and that Lionel was the one who was the possessor of the gun and that she knew what Lionel had did with it. So the the Niven hit itself, while valuable, becomes a lot more compelling once you get other 
um, intel sources to, uh, to 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 build on on what you learned from the the Niven hit. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is another example of um, you know utilizing other other sources to uh, to to bolster bolster your Niven efforts as well as your gun crime reduction efforts. So um, I didn't put his entire name because Jeremiah M is a juvenile, but um, we had a shot spotter activation on September 9th of last year at a location at 4046 Winborn Avenue. As we all know, the shot spotter activation is great. It tells you when and where the shooting happened. Evidence was recovered, but it doesn't tell you anything about who did the shooting um, just, just on its own and by itself. So um, my investigator uh, wanted to dig into that, that shooting event a little bit further because it was in an area of town that we were very interested in. So he uh, just Google mapped that location where the, uh, where the shooting happened. Uh, nobody was shot. It was a, just a firearm discharge in the air kind of situation. But when he, when he pulled the uh, Google, Google Maps uh, information from that location, you notice that building that you see in the middle picture being the building, the, the shooting happened in the parking lot with that building in the front. And you can see the, the very unique paint job on the corner of that building. Well, it turns out that about an hour after the shot spotter activation, we were also on Jeremiah M's social media and following him on there. And as you can see in that still shot from the, from the video that we captured, uh, you can see him holding the gun in, in, in the video, you actually see him shooting it. Um, then about an hour after the, 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 the shooting, uh, he posts another picture on his social media with him wearing that red shirt, um, flashing that black and silver semi-automatic pistol, and you, and you can clearly see, see who it is. So um, with just the shot spotter technology, you, you, you don't know the who, and with just the social media, you don't know the when and the where, but uh, by leveraging and combining all of those efforts into one, we were able to identify who was responsible for that shooting um, on, that, on that particular occasion. That's about all I have. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, my contact information is, is attached if anybody needs to get in touch with me in the future and wants to discuss further. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Brian. Hi, everybody. Um, as the introduction said, my name is Brian Gray. Um, I'm an assistant district attorney, and the way to pronounce this pronounce this county is Schenectady County. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's all right. When I heard that uh, you couldn't pronounce it, I decided uh, it's a Mohawk Native American word from the in Iroquois Indian tribe, meaning the place beyond the pines, uh, which is a movie starring Ryan Gosling and Bradley Cooper. But it's Schenectady County, so that's the county that I'm from. Um, it's a uh, relatively smaller jurisdiction. Um, the ma overwhelming majority of our crime comes from the city of Schenectady itself, which is a city of about 80,000 people. Um, we are consistently, um, not a statistic we're proud of, but we are um, consistently ranked one of the most violent um, small cities in the state of New York. We have approximately 155 police officers assigned to the city. Um, I work at a DA's office that has 25 assistant district attorneys, and three of us are assigned to the major crime bureau. So we have, um, that's a pretty big percentage of ADAs just assigned to gun crimes for such a small city. Um, we have um, two detectives who work exclusively with us on gun crime. We have a DA's office investigator who does the same. And uh, we work with all the agencies such as FBI, ATF, um, New York State Police, other local agencies um, to try to get our job done. But that's a basic background of Schenectady County. So let's move on to the actual presentation. So slide, please. Um, the number one thing I like to say during these presentations is just getting to know everybody involved just makes our job so much easier. I know that's very easy for me to say, coming from such a small jurisdiction. I know it's much more difficult in bigger cities, and there's a lot more turnover in big cities. But I just like to say that, you know, 
from personal experience, if I get a call from somebody I've never met before, never heard of before, and they're just demanding all this work from me, I hang up the phone. I think that person is kind of an ass. Uh, I obviously do the work because it's my job, but it kind of leaves a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth. But on the other hand, if you actually reach out, you meet these detectives, you meet the ADAs, you meet the uh, ballistic ex ballistics experts, DNA, serology, you go to the lab, you have those face-to-face -face meetings. You know, when you get to call somebody and you say, like, hey, Maria, or hey, Andrea, or hey, Ed, um, and everybody knows who each other are, it kind of, I found, just from personal experience, it really helps everyone get on the same page. Um, we all have very stressful jobs that require hours that go beyond our normal um, pay, and uh, just doing it for people you know you get along with, I find makes it a lot easier. Um, we grab beers together after work. Um, just to try to unwind. So I just, that's just some advice I like to give. Um, all right, next slide. Uh, the other thing we do um, is we just have policies where I don't have to call a detective and say, hey, did you do this? Um, I know they did it because uh, we work together and um, we say, we said years ago, hey, when you guys get a new gun case, this is what we want you to do. If you find the gun, obviously swab the gun. And swabbing the gun involves swabbing the outside, swabbing the slide, uh, taking out the magazine, sliding the magazine, or swabbing the magazine, swabbing the individual um, unspent rounds just to see if we can get that um, DNA profile we're looking for. Um, I don't know about other people's jurisdictions, and this is relatively new. Um, I'm, I've been hearing from juries a lot lately. Is we we do swab spent shell casings, but we typically don't get them analyzed because the DNA experts tell us, hey, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've never gotten a usable DNA profile from spent shell casings. The defense attorney stands up, tells the jury how lazy we are, how we don't want to do our jobs, and how there was critical evidence on those shell casings, but we didn't bother. You know, their client's life and liberty is at on stake, and we can't even bother to do these simple tests. Um, and I've never lost a trial because of that, but I have had juries deliberate for a really long time, and then once they get the verdict, I go in the back and I say, hey, uh, you know, any tips, what you guys think? And numerous times I've had the jury just say to me, we really did not like that you didn't send, send the shell casing swab to the lab for DNA analysis. And then I say to them, well, didn't you hear the experts um, tell you that we don't typically get usable DNA profiles? And they say, yeah, but we just feel like it should have been done. And the reason jurors think that is because they don't think um, – that it's difficult or time consuming to do such a thing. They watch TV, they get a DNA profile in 10 minutes, they think it's easy work, you just um, swab something, throw it into a computer and you instantly get the results. And no matter how much I have the expert explain that that's not how it works, uh, jurors are lay people and it's just an easy technique that I've noticed our defense attorneys have been using time and time again. The lab, it drives them completely nuts, but I, um, if I, I only send them for um, the swabs of spent shell casings to the lab for analysis if I know it's going to be a trial that goes because obviously I don't want people doing unnecessary work when it's just going to be a plea. But it's just something I've noticed over the years and I would suggest others doing as well. Um, send the casings in themselves to be entered into NIBIN. Um, Obviously, if a gun is recovered, um, entering the serial number, checking to see if it's uh, registered, if it was reported stolen. If it is uh, um, the gun is reported stolen, um, we have an ATF agent that works exclusively with us, obviously, on gun crimes or ATF, and we've been having them actually interview the registered owners, and we've gotten a lot of great information. A lot of times they'll tell us, hey, listen, I know my gun was gone. I didn't report it stolen because my cousin is a drug addict and I knew he stole it and I didn't want to get him to trouble, that sort of thing. But the, what we've been doing with that information is actually pulling those owners' um, pistol permits because they're obviously not responsible gun owners if their guns go missing for five years and they don't report it or let anybody know. Obviously, there's the innocent gun owner who had his house broken into or didn't know his gun was stolen. but um, We've been finding a lot of people are surprisingly uh, upfront with us about what happened to their gun. So uh, the other thing we have to do in New York State, I know we have people from all different jurisdictions here, but in New York State, any weapons charge, the gun has to be operable. So I don't know what other states have those rules, but in case they do, 
Um, so if we get a gun and it's inoperable, whether or not the firing pin is uh, malfunctioned or doesn't work or whatever the case may be, um, we can't charge a crime in New York State. So we we find ways, uh, creative ways around that by charging. If the inoperable gun is loaded with live ammunition, we can charge attempt to possess that gun because nobody would, um, if they knew the gun was inoperable, it doesn't make any sense to load it. So we've had some su success charging attempt. But the other thing, um, Will was going into this a lot, is just coordinating with other jurisdictions. We, I've come to know the assistant U.S. attorney in our jurisdiction that works with um, the city of Schenectady. Um, I've gotten to know him really well. And when we have a case where we have an inoperable gu operable gun, the feds don't have that problem. Um, for the feds, they can have a bullet, they can have a stock, they can have a slide, and for them it's a gun. It doesn't matter if it's a small piece of a gun, the gun doesn't work. If there's a felon who's in possession of that, in the overwhelming majority of our cases here in Schenectady County, the person possessing the firearm is a previously convicted felon, usually with a long rap sheet. Uh, we call them and just say, hey, this is a really bad guy. He's responsible for a lot of violence in our community. We found him with an inoperable gun. Can you please take this case? And they're more than happy to help us out and get the end result we're looking for. Uh, next slide. All right, when I typed up this slide, I kind of laughed uh, because a lot of times people um, have too much, uh, too many meetings, and it just actually wastes their time where they can't get any real work done. Um, so the suggestion of this slide is to have um, meetings that actually matter, where you actually accomplish something. It doesn't have to be an hour meeting. If one week the meeting takes 15 minutes, that's great. Just get what you have to say out there and have everybody uh, go back to work. Sometimes the meetings take a lot longer because there's a lot more complications. But we have a standing meeting every single two weeks. Um, in New York State, it's a federal grant called the GIVE Grant, which is a um, gun-involved violence elimination grant from the federal government. It requires us to have this meeting for stat tracking. But I feel like we really use this meeting to our advantage, even though we have to have it. We um, we go in there and the top thing we do is update each other on ongoing investigations or cases. We talk about um, recent prosecutions. But we also have top targets lists. Um, Will was getting into this a lot. We have these targets. We know they're out there committing heinous violent crimes. They're, they're shooting up houses. They're shooting other drug dealers. But no one will cooperate against them. We're getting um, hearsay from confidential informants or hearing things on the street. But we just can't prove it. And uh, what we've actually been doing when we have the opportunity is getting these targets and figuring out other ways to arrest them. Um, we know they're a drug dealer. Do we have a CI that can go into their house and buy drugs? Yeah, they're not going to get the same amount of prison time as if uh, we caught them for the actual shooting. But there's uh, two things we find happen from this. A, you get them off the streets, so that makes the streets safer. Even if we get them off the streets for three, four, five years, even one year if we can, the other thing we've noticed is once that person is incarcerated, witnesses are more likely to come forward or be honest with us because the um, threat of retaliation is gone with them in jail or them in prison. We've uh, looked into their houses. If they're on probation, we have probation officers do searches of their house, um, searches coordinated with us. We look at where they're living. We see who they're living with. We, we see if they're receiving any benefits. We see if we can get any kind of like welfare fraud. You know, is there a domestic violence situation with a girlfriend? Even on misdemeanors, um, we, we push for max sentences on our top targets on even low level crimes just to get that six month, nine month year of them off the streets. During these meetings, we help each other out. We bounce ideas off each other. We have uh, local police, state police, uh, federal agents, um, people of different experiences, backgrounds. People are learning um, new ideas, things that they haven't thought of. We think outside the box. Um, and then there's other simple things where I say, hey, I'm, I'm working on this prosecution, and I cannot find this witness. And I had a detective who said, hold on, I got a cell phone number. In the meeting, the, the detective is texting back and forth with my witness. Me and my investigators have been looking for them for about two weeks, and uh, I met with that witness later that day. He just texted him. He said, hey, you got to go to the DA's office, and the guy showed up. So having these meetings with these people can be very beneficial. Um, obviously, the size of your jurisdiction makes these meetings. The frequency of these meetings um, change. Like for us, we do it every two weeks, and that seems to be good. But if you have a bigger jurisdiction, they might have to happen more often. 
Uh, next slide. Um, this is another slide, like the first one that I always throw in, um, and I just say this, for the love of God, anybody here who's, uh, in this um, uh, seminar who's a prosecutor, please update your detectives and your forensic experts on the status of the case. Um, I would just think how frustrated I would be as a prosecutor if I was working as a second seat to a higher up prosecutor on a big case. He asked me to do all this case law research, interview all these witnesses. I'm working my butt off, and then I find out that the guy pled guilty a week later. Um, Will talked a lot about streamlining um, the case and putting a focus to get faster results, putting a focus on the uh, more high-risk cases, and, and I think that's great, obviously. Uh, but the other thing is a lot of our labs will not be as um, swamped with work if they are consistently getting updated um, by the prosecutors in the case whenever there's a plea deal. If they can stop working on that case because a guy pled guilty and immediately work on another case, um, obviously that saves a lot of time. Um, and then those new cases that they get to work on will get results a lot faster. And I've just, from getting to know the lab people and finding out how often they'll be working on a case for one, two, three weeks, and they'll finally call the prosecutor and say, hey, I thought we were supposed to go to trial. And the prosecutor says, oh, that guy pled guilty a month ago. Um, we just have to think of each other. Like, let the detectives know, because even though there's been an arrest, um, our detectives sometimes will still be working on the case with us if they can. So just let everybody involved uh, know when there has been a plea. All right, next slide. I'm going to move on to a case profile. All right, so this is the a case of the People versus Clarence Terry. Um, it was a case that was actually prosecuted by my, my by my direct supervisor, but I did a lot of help with the case. So back on July 12, 2016, there was a shooting at 501 Page Street in the city of Schenectady. So the shooting happens, the victim gets shot in the back of the neck, kind of um, at the very top of the back, uh, is transported to the hospital, uh, no one's found at the scene, no shell casings are found at the scene. This is a pretty um, rough neighborhood, so um, we had one 911 caller just saying that they heard a gunshot. Nobody who actually claims they saw anything. So we start investigating the case, interviewing witnesses, and we find out that the victim and this Clarence Terry had uh, past problems with each other because uh, Clarence Terry is the ex-boyfriend and our victim is the new boyfriend. Clarence Terry had kids with the woman. Uh, the victim did not. So there was an argument about custody and uh, custody exchanges. Um, both Clarence Terry and our victim were active members of um, two different gangs. They weren't necessarily rival gangs, but so we don't think that that had anything to do with it. It was more of a domestic situation. But we know that these two had problems with each other. They'd recently, uh, earlier that day, gotten into an argument with each other. No overt threats of shooting anybody um, were made. It was just a, an argument. We had a video of a car dropping an individual off about a block away from the scene at um, Schenectady and Van Vos, which is, can be seen on the map there. A person, um, the video was not a good enough quality to actually do a facial identification, but it matched the description, the body type of Clarence Terry, and they were uh, walking towards the scene. During the crime of the shoot time of the shooting, approximately three minutes later, that person is come back. It goes back to the vehicle, and that vehicle it drives away. Our city, it's a uh, area wise, it's a very small city. Um, besides just population, we have approximately 210 uh, city run cameras set up that our police utilize. We're able to track that vehicle to a housing complex where uh, Clarence Terry lives. In the vehicle, um, one of the cameras was able to pick up the license plate, and the vehicle that was driven to and from the scene was registered to Clarence Terry's father. So at this stage, we had a very, what I thought was a very good circumstantial case, but we did not have a single person who was going to say to us, I saw Clarence Terry shoot the victim on July 12, 2016. We just had the motive, we had the vehicle, but um, Clarence Terry and his father, they had similar builds. It was kind of, there was that issue too. So we had to think to ourselves before we made an arrest, because we don't like to make arrests on cases that we know we can't convict. How confident are we in this case? What else can we do? We know it's circumstantial. We know if we do arrest him, this is definitely the case that would go to trial. It's not an overwhelming proof case where we'd likely uh, get a plea. Uh, next slide. 
Here is a picture of our victim uh, in the hospital. Again, there was a single gunshot wound. Um, he was being, him being a gang member. Hey, I don't know what to tell you, man. I was shot in the back. I didn't see the guy. No one said anything to me. I didn't see where he came from. Literally no detail. It was all he would tell us is that he was shot, in fact, that we already knew. So when surgery was done, a um, projectile was recovered from the victim. It was a small caliber. It was consistent with um, being a 22 caliber. Um, again, the victim told us he was not cooperative. He didn't want to be labeled a snitch. He wouldn't be interviewed by the police. Um, he was subpoenaed for grand jury, but wouldn't, wouldn't tell us anything other than the fact that we already knew, which was that he was shot. Um, and he told us that if he was called at trial, he would not take the stand and he would not testify. Next slide. So at this stage, uh, we did push forward with our circumstantial case. We put it through the grand jury. The grand jury uh, did indict Clarence Terry for charges of attempted murder, criminal possession of a weapon in the second degree, and uh, assault in the first degree. And um, we made that arrest because Clarence Terry was a very dangerous man. We knew we had probable cause to make the arrest. But at this stage, every day that passed, we were starting to get a little bit more worried about the case, saying, okay, it's still, it's still circumstantial. When's this going to break? When are we going to get that witness who's going to tell us that they actually saw anything? Was the good case good enough to secure a guilty verdict? We just kept asking um, ourselves these questions over and over again. Should we offer a plea bargain in a lower range to try to get that plea um, that we were looking for. And uh, my boss ultimately said no. Um, she's like a really hard-nosed prosecutor, um, like a pit bull in the courtroom. She, even though we had all these issues with the case, her pretrial offer was 18 years on a plea to attempted murder, which uh, Clarence Terry would not accept. All right, next slide. So now I'm gonna change gears a little bit. That was July of 2016. So now in March of 2017, two months before the trial date, um, we had the People versus Marcel Johnson. So uh, the last map that was up with the Clarence Terry case was um, about three blocks um, southwest of the new mark, which is on Germania Ave. So just in a completely unrelated case, having nothing to do with Clarence Terry, um, the uh, formerly known as the Vice Squad, the Special Investigation Unit, uh, began looking into this house at Germania Ave where there was a uh, heroin, crack cocaine. But the reason that um, they took this house most seriously is because um, the dealer was lacing heroin with fentanyl, which has led to overdoses of, um, we didn't know if it was his heroin with fentanyl that was actually killing people. We had a lot of fentanyl overdoses in our city over the past couple of years. So we heard that this dealer was lacing. Um, so they secured a confidential informant who was willing to go into that house and uh, do controlled wire buys of crack cocaine. Next slide. So on March 24th and April 10th, the confidential informant went into uh, 262 uh, Germania Ave and purchased crack cocaine from Marcel Johnson. This is an actual still image from the controlled wire buy. The person we're seeing is Marcel Johnson. Um, my favorite part about this case uh, by far is that the confidential informant walks in. He's basically like, hey, what's up, man? Like, I'm looking to get some uh, get some stuff, what you got. And he immediately gets shushed by Marcel Johnson. He's like, shh, shh, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. And the uh, camera, the uh, hidden camera that the CI was wearing pans towards the TV. And you can see that Marcel Johnson is watching a TV show, and he doesn't, he doesn't want the confidential informant to interrupt him. So the funny part about this is that the uh, defendant, Marcel Johnson, was watching a show called Gangsters in America, King Blood, um, the Luis Felipe story. And Luis Felipe is the uh, creator of the Latin Kings. He created them in Sing Sing Prison. And literally after he gets shushed, you hear the narrator say, I'm going to do my best narrator voice here. And in the end, they would all turn. They would all talk except for one. King Blood, Louis Felipe. They all went into the witness pr protection program. They essentially got off scot-free because they only really wanted him. So uh, I just think it's so fun. You can't even make this stuff up that our CI goes in to make a buy. The drug dealer is watching a, uh, a story about a gang leader who only went down because uh, his own people were quote unquote snitches and rats. These are the words that we hear every day and also that they were using in this tele television program. Um, 
So they continued to watch that show talking about rats and snitches for about five minutes before our first commercial break, and then the uh, drug sale actually happened. Next slide. All right, so um, based on these two drug sales, the uh, Special Investigation Unit went to a uh, judge to secure a warrant for the house, and a um, search warrant was executed uh, with a SWAT team. They emptied out the house, and during the search, they found all of these items that are on your screen right now in a little toiletries bag, which was on that um, old leather couch right next to where Marcel Johnson was sitting. Um, it's easy to tell some of the items here, but the uh, I called it the drug dealing kit. It was filled with heroin, crack cocaine, powdered cocaine, marijuana, fentanyl, and a 22 caliber semi-automatic handgun. And yep, if you just click, it's hard to see on this screen, but uh, the um, serial number was attempted to be filed off, um, but you can still just barely make out those numbers. Next slide. And then um, these are just additional items. Doesn't have anything to do with my case profile. Just different items are also found in M Marcel Johnson's room. That's a modified uh, 22 semi-automatic um, pistol, and then a rifle that had some uh, armor-piercing rounds. Next slide. All right. So we took. Uh, so now I'm going to move on to a third case, a third uh, completely unrelated case. Um, that occurred in North Carolina. On May 5th, 2009, a resident of Hope Mills, North Carolina, reported that her P-22 Walther 22 caliber handgun with that serial number was stolen from her house. And you, it was hard to tell from the last slide, but I can assure you that that's the serial number that um, showed up on that 22 that was recovered from Marcel Johnson's house. So when that gun was collected from Marcel Johnson, the detectives ran the serial number through eJustice New York, found out it was reported stolen. They were, uh, contacted the Hope Mills, North Carolina Police Department, uh, requested a copy of the incident report where they, uh, they um, emailed that up to us. And yep, next slide, you can go to the next slide. And I'm assuming everyone here can guess this, but uh, these, these three cases were obviously all related. The, uh, we called the victim of the burglary who told us that um, her gun was stolen from her house by name of Clarence Terry, who lived in New York um, and had stolen it uh, seven years earlier. It was a, uh, a friend of her son's. He was spending the night, and when he left the next morning, he stole her gun. Um, we were able to, uh, we applied to the judge, it's called a Molyneux application, we were able to get that proof in. Uh, we flew the witness up from North Carolina to testify about this, and the uh, jury ultimately convicted. Clarence Terry of attempted murder in the second degree, assault in the first degree, criminal possession of a weapon, the weapon in the second degree, and the judge sentenced him to 20 years state prison. So just here, we have three different cases. We have three different uh, detectives and you know, police agencies working on three different cases completely unrelated and had any of them taken a shortcut, just not bothered to do it, um, we never would have found this tie. We found this tie literally less than a month before the trial happened. Uh, perfect timing to be able to use it at our trial and secure the conviction uh, we were looking for. So next slide. So here's all my personal information. Uh, I really appreciate everybody's time and uh, listening to this conference. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Will, and thanks, Brian, with respect to um, your presentations. We really appreciated uh, how, you, how well you detailed out how important it is to be able to have true collaboration among agencies and even within within a local area, but also across the states. Did want to let you know that there are various resources that can be found uh, and as this first slide is showing. And then the next slide also has uh, more information as well as our contact information. You can see that sophomoreprime.com uh, with pro bono books and workshops that are offered by Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology. And next year, uh, this is the last of the webinars this year, but next year there will be a series of webinars. The topic's yet to be determined, and I'm going to turn it back over to Eric.
All right. Thank you very much, Ron. Will, Brian, you guys did a great job. Brian, I do think you have an alternative career as a narrator if, uh, if you ever end up deciding to do that. Um, at this point, we do have a number of questions that have come in. Uh, we'll try to get through all of them. Uh, the first question that was asked by, by a couple of folks, actually, is um, asking you, Ron, Will, Brian, can you talk about what, in your experience and in general, what is the turnaround time for a hit to be developed? And, and people are asking this because they've just started a unit and they want to try to identify some sort of base, uh, baseline measure there. So how long does it usually take to get a hit? Well, it, 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 this is Ron. It depends on a NIBIN site. Uh, there are some NIBIN sites that are really timely in terms of uh, being able to do acquisition and correlation reviews. It, it's not technology limited. Actual acquisition takes about eight minutes, a correlation review anywhere from 10 to 15. Uh, typically, uh, there are many sites that are now producing NIBIN leads. That's an unconfirmed NIBIN lead within 24 to 72 hours. And it can be done within an eight-hour shift if, if there is a need for that and a rush can be put on that. For an actual hit, which is a confirmed connection between two cases that is solely dependent on a forensic laboratory that the case is being sent to. This is Will. I can talk to our our experience in Baton Rouge um, on a on a major priority case where we we're, where we request a rush. Uh, it can be it, we get the leads within 24 to 48 hours. Um, naturally, that we, we and we prioritize a lot, a lot of a lot of our incidents. Uh, that puts some of the low harm cases on the back burner, which would, which sometimes can take take uh, take a week or two. Um, but the high priority cases, we're getting them out, getting them out pretty quick. This is Brian. Uh, I completely agree with uh, what Will said. I would just say um, what I, I've noticed is if I um, is. If you really let them know this is a high priority case, but you're you know you're not crying wolf all the time, you can't make every case a high like a super high priority case. But on the murders, uh, you know where somebody's paralyzed, really serious shooting cases, we're getting a very fast turnaround of only a couple of days. Great, thanks guys. Uh, the next question is, is oriented towards Will, but certainly if other solutions, uh, you have experience with other solutions, Brian and Ron, I'd love to hear that. Uh, for Will, you mentioned SharePoint as your uh, main data collection point for information provided by the Nyman lab team, the prosecutors and the officers. I have an interest in using this same platform as a way to share information. What are your thoughts in regards to data security in this platform coming from a legal perspective? Um, it, it's worked well for us. Uh, our our page is only accessible to um, CSU because we also warehouse a lot of um, intelligence in there, other than you know gun crimes intelligence. Um, so it's not an open portal for uh, for everybody in law enforcement or even in our office to access. But it's worked out well for us, and um, and we've been able to manage it and and pull the information from it. It's it's worked well for us as just having a central point to to warehouse all of the information. Um, we're currently working with our IT folks on a few things that are above my head, just kind of to try to automate some of those processes as they as they come out of the lab. Um, but but so far, SharePoint has been a been a been a has worked for us um, in the in the first couple of years that we've been doing this. We hope to bolster it a little bit and come up with some new ideas on how to streamline some things. But it's worked out well. Great, thanks, Brian. Ron, do you uh, guys have any software that you have experience with for sharing information? Uh, the only software that I have ex I don't have practical experience with that I've seen it is GunOps. And that is, um, it's a cloud-based platform, and it's pretty secure, and it's a way of sharing information with regards to shooting incidents, um, and uh, several police agencies are actually using it. I know that in Baton Rouge, we, we may be moving from, from our whole SharePoint system and, and at some point moving to GunOps. Um, you know, we've been in discussions with my front office to see if that's something we can fund. So that may that may be a route we're going in the future. Great. Thank you all very much. 
Uh, regarding the use of shot spotter, have uh, will have you guys experienced a decrease in the number of shots fired since you've deployed your shot spotter uh, system? Um, well, we've, we've had shot spotter in Baton Rouge for a number of years. I think that what we what we realized um, when we started the CSU was that it was being underutilized and maybe not utilized properly. Um, one of our first goals was to to take our target areas and, and just try to get an idea of the extent of the gun crime problem in those particular areas. What we realized very quickly was that we're reading police report after police report where an officer would respond to a shot, shot spotter activation, not see anybody in need of assistance, and would resume patrol. Um, naturally, that caused us some concern because a lot of valuable evidence was being left at those scenes and not collected. Uh, what we realized is that a lot of the, the officers on the street weren't being um, outfitted with the technology to go to the pin on the map and were getting the shot spotter information via dispatch, which would often be a block or a corner or an intersection. And um, as, you can, as you can imagine, going out to a scene in the middle of the night where there's nobody there and you have no information as to where the actual shooting occurred, the... Um, the likelihood of recovering evidence becomes almost impossible at that point. So um, we've worked to get the officers outfitted with the technology so that they can go to the pin on the map and recover the recover the evidence. Um, we we have a ton of shots fired down here, and um, I don't know that we've necessarily seen a reduction. Uh, we're we're relatively new at this since we've started kind of analyzing the data. Um, we're hoping to see. Um, the officers utilizing the technology to, to, to recover that necessary evidence so we can get it analyzed and then you know see if we can make some make some positive gains on identifying those shooters and have a positive result but it's it, we're a little early on right now to, to, to you know see any sort of significant uh, trend in the data sure definitely understand uh, next question, Brian, you mentioned uh, briefly, and, and Ron, I think you have some experience in this w as well. Brian, you mentioned a grant uh, during your presentation. Could you repeat the name of that grant? And then again, Ron, Will, if you guys have any insight about funding that is available out there. Yeah, it's the um, uh, GIVE grant is the acronym, and it spells for Gun Involved Violence Elimination. And it's a it's a... I believe it's a federal grant. I'm not the person in the office who does the grant writing, but um, I, I believe it's a federal grant. And one of the things I want to add, this is Ron. One of the things that individuals can do is go to the uh, first webinar in this series uh, that Justice, Justice Clearinghouse has uh, for some more grant information as well. I did want to speak to the shot spotter uh, issue really quick. What you'll find is that when shot spotter is employed, you're going to find that the number of the actual shootings will rise because shot spotter has demonstrated through studies that approximately 75 to 80 percent of shootings go unreported, especially in neighborhoods where there's a high volume of shootings because it's considered another day in the life of that community, and a lot of those shots are unreported. So what you're going to find is that initially the number of shooting incidents is going to go way up uh, because simply you have access to more uh, shootings than you did before. Really, really good point. Thank you for uh, for raising that. And for uh, those folks that are interested and uh, in gun crime. Uh, gun crime grants and the webinar uh, that Ron mentioned, uh, send me an email and I'll, get, I'll make sure that you get access to that webinar. Um, the last question that I think we're going to be able to take for today before we close it out is a question for Will, but again, um, you know, anyone else, please weigh in, goes to your staffing and specifically um, how, much help, uh, how much help and information was obtained and developed by your intelligence guys and how was this used by the National Guard? personnel? And is it information that can be developed by a crime analyst that is not related to the National Guard? Um, I think I understand your question, but yeah, um, the, our, our National Guard analysts, um, yeah, our, all of our local law enforcement agencies also have their, have their own analysts, which our, our National Guard analysts work closely with. Um, so yeah, there's no, there's there's nothing, you know, special about them being a, a National Guard analyst as opposed to a, a civilian. 
Um, but you know the the partnership with the National Guard is certainly great because that's two full time employees that we have in house that our district attorney's office, who's I'm sure many of many other offices around the country are strapped financially, don't have to don't have to fund those positions. So um, they've they've been a huge resource for us. Um, uh, and and again, this is this is not the work that they do is they don't teach you in law school and uh, don't teach our investigators that and. Um, you know they're they're able to take the crime, the same crime data that the law enforcement analysts have access to also, but uh, you know work the data to, towards our goal, which is identifying priority offenders for prosecution. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I also want to again thank our sponsors. Uh, Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology has been a wonderful partner to work with over the past year uh, in terms of educating the community. Um, certainly want to thank Ron, Will, Brian for your time today and thank our audience. If you need to get access to this presentation or any of the other five presentations that have been sponsored by Ultra, again, send me an email and we'll make sure that you get the necessary links. And with that, uh, this closes today's Justice Clearinghouse webinar. Everyone have a wonderful holiday season, and uh, please stay safe. Bye now.